good afternoon to you and welcome to another Paddocks Club tutorial. Today we're going to talk about utility and service charge issues. And we're going to take three issues that have come up in the discussion forum. The first is, when services are separately metered, can the body corporate decide to charge in accordance with the participation quota schedule? This was a question that Skalk asked on the forum. The background was that the managing agent in these circumstances told the trustees that they must ignore the water meters. They must include the estimated water charges in the budget and collect them from owners in accordance with PQ. Well, prescribed management rule 33 um, caters for the situation of separate meter. It says that if the majority of owners tell them to do so uh, by way of a decision in a meeting, then the trustees must procure separate meters. Um, and at that is at the body corporate's cost to record the consumption of electricity, water, gas in regard to any individual section. PMR um, uh, uh, 33.4 goes on and says, if and for so long as no separate meters are installed, then, um, then, then you pay per PQ. But this clearly implies that once they have been put in, um, these uh, these meters must be read, and their metering, uh, the, the metered consumption must be charged for. It's a clear implication: if separately metered, relevant body corporate expenses must be recovered on the basis of the metered consumption. And the same principle applies to any other separately metered utility. Right, let's move on to the second issue. How does the body corporate recover a sewerage or other utility charge which is calculated by the person charging on a per unit basis? Well, this was a question that Faisal asked. Um, now, the fundamental is that how the charge is calculated by the local municipality is not relevant. It sounds strange, even perhaps unfair, but the Act gives specific instructions as to how the body corporate's administrative cost must be recovered from owners and holders of rights in the common property. The principles are set out in sections 32 and 37, and to take you through them quickly, right holders, that is exclusive use and future development right holders, must at least cover the body corporate's costs relative to those areas. But the rules may in fact provide for higher regular payments, not unusual. In purely residential schemes, all expenses that are not separately metered must be recovered per PQ, unless there's a special rule made under 32.4 that varies that arrangement. If your scheme has such rules for exclusive use um, contributions or under 32.4, they should be highlighted and kept in mind whenever expense recovery is discussed in the scheme. Let's move on to our third topic. Can the body corporate offer additional services or utilities? And this was Mike's query. And he gave as a background a situation in which there was apartment leasing. But that's not the only possibility. The, um, in, in a case where most of the, um, of, of the units are owned by, by investor owners and they're only used on holidays, if at all, yes, my situation was that the body corporate was running a letting operation. Um, but this is not, as I say, the only thing. You quite often have situations where people want special types of internet access and the body corporate can provide it at a better rate or television uh, access. Um, some schemes do meals on wheels, other offer, uh, others offer housekeeping services or frail care facilities. There are a whole range of things which bodies corporate can do for their members. Under Section 38I, the body corporate has the power to enter into an agreement with an owner or occupier of a section for the provision of amenities or services by the body corporate. So it's perfectly legal. Um, whenever the body corporate is engaged in activities that affect some, but not all of their owners, however, there is the risk of interest groups forming and with different agendas, those who, who take part in, the, in this additional scheme and those who don't. And, and you have to make sure that there isn't cross-subsidization otherwise nastiness will happen. I suggest three steps that might be worth considering where your scheme does go beyond the statutory obligations and do the other things that it's entitled to in terms of its particular rules and Section 38i. First, ensure that the governance uh, documents set out the framework for these activities so anyone considering buying into the scheme can see the full picture. And also so that trustees and owners have a clear description of the arrangements that they can refer to, see exactly what is, uh, is, is to be done and not to be done. Ring fencing of the non-core activities makes sense. This makes sure that those not involved are not financially affected. They must be separate but obviously integrated, if the body corporate is going to do it, um, in the bookkeeping and in the actual accounting systems. 
putting in place a system that allows owners to opt in and opt out on reasonable notice. So that if you have a bunch of swallows who spend uh, you know, the summer in, 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 in the UK and come out here only six months of the year and they only want meals during those six months, that, they can, that, that, that the system works for them but doesn't discriminate against them unreasonably. So that's the story for today. I hope that these, uh, that these three stories about utility and service charge issues were of assistance to you. And thank you. If we have any questions, we'll deal with them in the discussion forum.